Just Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that Lord, we all are interested, Lord, in hearing your word, Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you are giving me wisdom and helping us others also, Lord, as we partake in the discussion, Lord, to just grow in our knowledge and understanding of you, Father. Help us during uh, today's session, Father, as we look at these verses from your Philippians chapter 3. We pray that you will guide us, Lord, into better understanding, uh, Lord, and, and better knowing of Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Okay, now uh, <clears throat> I'm going straight into the video. As I said, the video is a, uh, today's is a bit long. It's almost 19 minutes and he's talking very fast. So please concentrate on what he's saying uh, because after that we have to go through our, uh, my normal uh, expose also of the whole thing. So <laughs> let's see how it goes now, okay? Oh, by the way, I, I, I think I told you all uh, last week, if you want to just temporarily speak, uh, you can, if you are using a computer, you can press, hold down your space bar and you can talk. The microphone will be activated. When you release your space bar, the microphone will be deactivated. So that's the easiest way to just say yes or no. If like I say, if I, if I ask you, can you hear me? And somebody wants to say yes, you can just hold down the space bar of your keyboard if you're using a computer or a laptop, okay? I found that out last so week. We go straight into uh, uh, a study. We're looking at Philippians chapter uh, 3, uh, verses uh, 1 to 14, according to DeFazio, but I'll be looking only at verses 1 to 11, and I'll take up the balance three verses next week, okay? Uh, so, yeah, please concentrate because he speaks very fast, uh, but it's important stuff, okay? Do you believe that life with Jesus is better than life without him? And why? And forgive me for beginning with such a kind of an in-your-face intense question, but I do think that that question hangs over the text that we're looking at today, the first half of chapter 3 in Philippians. As we work our way through this letter, I find myself asking this question. As I look at our world today, I find myself asking this question of myself and of others. Do you believe that life with Jesus is better than life without him? And again, you have to ask the second one, why? Now, the cost of discipleship is becoming increasingly real. Now, it's always been real. Like, following Jesus is never, never not a costly thing. But at times in our cultural context, it has been a little bit, a little bit less obvious than not. But now it seems that it is pretty much hard to miss. Always been true for those with eyes. Now we all have eyes to see it. I don't know if you noticed this, but, but the world is changing around us. And sometimes people complain about this. Sometimes people worry about this. Well, whatever you're going to feel or think about it, like, like it's happening. And we're entering a, a time that is different than the time that, that many of us grew up in and many of our fathers and grandfathers and mothers and grandmothers grew up in. And many have said that, that in, in a way, in Western culture and in America in particular, we're returning to a time when Christianity is going to look a lot like what it did in the first few centuries of its existence. You know, for the first uh, couple of centuries of, of, of Christian life, really up into the time of Constantine, Christianity w was a minority. It, it was kind of over on the side and it wasn't always highly regarded and sometimes it was outright persecuted. It cost a lot to be a Christian. And then all of a sudden, it became legal, and then it became the official religion of the empire. And at that point, it became socially advantageous to identify yourself with Jesus. And this is when we had a number of people come into the church who weren't actually interested in following Jesus. Well, some have said that uh, in the American context, say what you will about our history, it has been, for better or worse, fairly socially advantageous in certain circles to be a follower of Jesus. Now, that is not the case anymore. Anymore, you probably know this, just as well in your context anymore, it may actually cost you to identify with Jesus. And so this is the world we live in. And what if it gets worse? Like, what are you going to do if it becomes obviously costly to say, I am a person who belongs to Jesus? I think that you'll be well equipped to wrestle with this question if you understand the text in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Let's read it and see what Paul says. He says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve by his, God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church 
As for righteousness based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Now I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of His resurrection and participation in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. And not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. What is Paul doing in Philippians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14? Well, at one level, he's he's telling his story, his testimony time. Paul has told the story of Jesus, he's talked about Timothy and Epaphroditus, and now he's telling his story. A bit more concretely, he's telling his story as a contrast. Two parts of his story, life under the law and life in Christ. These are the two parts of the story that that Paul seems to be laying out for us, and as he contrasts his past life under the law with his present life in Christ, he is demonstrating the superiority of life in Christ to life in all other things or places. And he does this essentially by listing out his accomplishments. He says, listen, I know some people like to put their confidence in the flesh. If that's the game we're playing, y'all, I'm in a good place. I got all kinds of things to boast about. And he needs to list out seven blessings, seven of his accomplishments, seven status markers in the Jewish culture. He lists out some of them that he obtained by birth. For instance, Hebrew of Hebrews, he learned to speak Hebrew. Tribe of Benjamin, look, I'm from the tribe that produced the first king. Uh, You know, people of Israel. Some of these are by birth, and then some of them are by effort. So, so some things were given to him as an advantage based on the family and context that he was born into, but he didn't just stop there. It wasn't just that he was given some, some advantages, it was that he worked hard for some more. Look, you talk about zeal, y'all, I was persecuting the church. You talk about righteousness based on the law, I look at myself as faultless. Paul doesn't think he was perfect, but he knows that he was very good at keeping the law and that the sacrifices covered the parts that he didn't do so well. And so Paul lays out all of these accomplishments in his life. And then he says, but you want to know what I think of those things now? I think of them as a loss. And this is what it seems like an economic turn. If we're adding up debits and credits, if we're adding up gains and losses. He said, I used to think all of these were just increasing the gain side of the ledger. But now I recognize that they were actually on the opposite side. All of these things that I look to as these prideful accomplishments that have lifted me up, I now recognize that they were negatives. And if that wasn't enough, he adds a little bit more of a dramatic word. He says that they were, in the Greek, skubala. The NIV translates it garbage. I kind of like that word. It's it's a word that means sometimes like rubbish or dung or nastiness. It's a word that is supposed to connote like nasty. Just think about, all right, this is a little bit gross, but if you've had kids, you probably know what a diaper genie is, right? So after you change the kid's diaper, you put that thing in the diaper genie, and and then it just sits there, and it's covered up from the room, but eventually you have to kind of empty out the diaper genie. And so you open it up, and it's nasty, and you you cut that piece off, and you tie it up in a knot, and you take it out, and you throw it out in the trash can. Maybe you throw it out on Monday, and the trash truck isn't coming until Thursday. So a couple days later, you're taking out some more trash. You open up that trash can that's been sitting out in the middle of the summer heat, and it just hits you straight in the face, just knocks you backwards. That's the smell that I think Paul has in mind when he's talking about scubala, all of those things that you used to look to as being so impressive, all of those, you know, whether it was when you were younger, you got a scholarship to the right college, or when, when you came in, entered the workforce, look, look at the job that you got, look at the company that you worked for, look at the salary that you were given, look at the office in the corner that you enjoyed, or maybe it's that you have more and better kids than your neighbors, or maybe it's that you have more and better toys than your neighbors, or maybe it's that you know a bunch of languages, or that you're really, you have this sort of athletic ability that is unmatched by your peers. And Paul says, okay, fine, like I look at all of these things, these accomplishments, and they look like nothing to me. Why? Why does Paul regard such wonderful past accomplishments as a loss, as rubbish? I, I, I know you know the answer. You, you read the text, but let's think about it for a second. Like, why give all that up? I don't know if you noticed it, but we do have our, our cruciformity formula here a little bit. It's not exactly in the same form as what we see before, but Paul gives us a number of little verbal cues that he's patterning his story 
on the story of Jesus that he had previously told, not but because. I do not consider all these things again, but instead I regard them as a loss, as, as, as worth nothing, because of the superior value of belonging to Jesus. Okay, great, but what's so wonderful about belonging to Jesus? That's the question I think we have to ask, and don't answer it too quickly, because the cliches are not only not going to be convincing to the world around you, they're probably not even going to continue to be convincing to you. If you just puppet the answers that you've heard without actually experiencing the realities of which they speak, without actually reflecting on these things deep enough for it to be a core conviction of your own, I'm not sure it's going to hold. I'm not sure it's going to last. Why give up everything for the sake of Christ? That is the question I think that this text answers, and I think it gives us three pretty clear answers. Number one, why is Jesus so much better? Because in Christ, you enjoy a personal relationship with the Lord of the universe. Now, I want to be careful not to soapbox. This is not the place for soapboxes. I'm just trying to unpack the text. But i got to be honest with you. I think in certain respects, evangelicalism today, in our day, has overcorrected. In certain respects, we've overcorrected. I think we have reacted against the, the personalized, even privatized, consumerist, pragmatist, sadly, even at times racist heritage. We've looked at this heritage and we've said, there's a lot here we need to reject. And indeed, there is a lot here we need to reject. Absolutely. Like, by all means, throw out the bathwater, but save that precious baby. Because there's some things in here that I think we lose at our peril. And I remember growing up hearing a lot about a personal relationship with Jesus. You can have a personal relationship with God. And I'll be, I'll be frank, I just don't hear that language very much anymore. I don't find that to be a way in which people describe this. Now, can the language of personal relationship be stretched out and explained in ways that are less than biblical? Of course. But I think that this text gives us good reason to hang on to that idea and probably language pretty similar to it. Why? Well, first of all, because Paul says three times, I want to know Christ, to know him. To, to share in his sufferings, to know the power that is alive in him, to know him. This is a personal word. This is a word uh, to, to know that goes beyond just having an understanding of, that goes beyond just knowing in theory. It's, this, is, this, is, this is actually a word, uh, know, in the, in the ancient Hebrew that would have been used, a Greek word, but it relates to a Hebrew word that was often used as a euphemism for sexual intercourse between a husband and a wife. Adam knew Eve and she gave birth. That's the language that's used. And of course, the sexual connotation isn't always there, but the reason why that works as an expression is because this word has the idea of intimacy, of closeness, of friendship. When Paul says, I want to know Christ, and now I do know him, and I consider these things lost compared to the greatness of knowing him, he's not just talking about some ideas. He's talking about a relationship that he has with Jesus. The second thing I see in this text that supports this type of language is that he is the one place in his letters when he says, Christ Jesus, my Lord. Now, Paul believes, make no mistake, that Jesus is the Lord of the whole universe. He said as much in Ephesians chapter, or Philippians chapter 2 earlier, when he talked about how Jesus is exalted to the highest place and given the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow, that whole thing. Like, Lord, he is the Lord. Paul also believes that he is our Lord, Lord over the church and over all believers in the family of God that comes together as one people. But here you see, in addition to being the Lord and our Lord, he is my Lord. So why is Jesus superior? Why is life with him so much better? Because you enjoy a, a personal relationship with the Lord of the universe. Second thing you see in here is that your status before God is not based on religious performance. It's not based on your moral track record or how well you keep the rituals or how often you go to church. It's just, that's not how this works. He talks in here about the righteousness that's based on the law versus the righteousness found in, in Christ by, by faith in him. Well, what is he talking about? Well, this is something he unpacks in great detail elsewhere in Galatians and Romans. It's his doctrine of justification. And it's the idea that was worked out for him initially in the context of Jews and Gentiles trying to come together in Christ. Because these Gentiles would, became Christians. They got saved. And, and, then, and then some Christian Jews said, oh, well, well, in addition to just sort of your initial faith, you need to come up under the law to become really fully Christians. And Paul says, oh, no, you don't. You don't at all. It is not the works of the law that save. It, it is merely faith in Christ. And this was a particular expression in, in this context of, of a deeper truth that Paul unpacks elsewhere and that manifests itself here, that you are not saved. You are not uh, brought into salvation and you are not justified. You are not declared righteous on the basis of whether or not you keep a certain track record. You are not justified on the basis of works of the law or any other kind of works. But in fact, you are justified by faith in Christ, by grace through faith. That's the formula. Now, now we don't often use the language of justification. I wish we did. 
often we use the language of identity. And when we talk about identity, I think we're talking about something that Paul would explain in terms of justification. And what we have here is the idea that you have been given an identity. You've been given a status before God that tells you who you are, that is not based on how well you perfectly obey God. It is not based on righteousness based on the law. I think that there are two parts to this, really, this idea of, of, of justification. And the first idea is that you let God's opinion of you define you. You let who he says you are, your status before him, define you. Like, that's step one. But then you can't just stop there. Like, that's religion, letting God's opinion of you define you. That's cool. Like, you're not letting somebody else's opinion or how much money you have or whatever. Like, okay, great. But the second part is critical, critical. You let Christ's death define God's opinion of you. You got to have both. Some of us have the former, but not the latter. And so we feel like we can never measure up. Some of us have the latter, but not the former. Oh yeah, Christ's death defined God's opinion of me. Cool, I'm saved by grace. But you're not letting God's opinion of you define you. And so it feels like the gospel doesn't matter. Hold them both together and you have the good news of what you see in this passage. That you have a reason for the accusations that the enemy levels against you to bounce right off. And that reason is not your own moral perfection or religious track record. That reason is that you're covered by the blood of the one who is perfect and who died on your behalf. So why is Jesus superior? Because you don't don't have to constantly be trying to measure up in the eyes of God or anybody else because you are who God says you are and God says you are covered by the blood of Jesus. So second reason is status before God not based on religious performance. But that's not even all. The third thing you see in this text, I'm not making stuff up, in this text, your present sufferings anticipate eternal life. Your present frustrations anticipate eternal fulfillment. Your death will be followed by resurrection. That's what Paul says there in verses 10 and 11 of this passage. He's talking about how the template of Jesus' life or Jesus' life becomes a template for your life. And Jesus' life isn't just a story of, of life and death. It's a story of death and life. And Paul says something similar will be true for you if you stay in Jesus. It's, it's not just that like you were alive and then you died. It's like, like you, you died and, and you're going to suffer as a result of dying to the world that you currently live in. But like that, that death will be followed by resurrection life. He's asking you to view your life from an eternal perspective. And man, I fear, I fear that we are in danger of losing losing this this eternal heavenly perspective that is, I think, necessary to make sense of earthly existence. And once again, I'm trying to be careful to soapbox, but I'm just noticing it's become pretty popular to mock heavenly mindedness these days. It's pretty popular to say, oh, the problem with, with evangelicals, the problem with the church, the problem with Christians is that they're so focused on going to heaven when they die that they're no longer any earthly good here and now. And I understand that this is at times a very valid critique. And if any of you are sitting around going, oh, I'm going to heaven, so who really cares what happens in between now and then? You don't fully understand the gospel. Let me say that clearly. But at the same time, if you're focused on trying to like fix the here and now, and you're marginalizing heaven in order to do that, you're literally, as the saying goes, cutting off the limb of the tree on which you're trying to stand. Like, that's what's happening in this kind. It's like we're trying to Man, this concerns me so deeply. It's like we're trying to achieve faith and especially love without hope. And I just don't see in the scriptures that those things are able to be pulled apart. I mean, listen, Paul says in elsewhere, 1 Corinthians 15, that if you have hope only for this life, you're to be pitied more than all men. Paul is deeply committed to pursuing transformation in Christ and pursuing as much good as he can while he still is in the body. He said that in Philippians 1. But he does this because he is driven by the hope of a future that is better than the current chapter in which he's living. When you want to understand a story, you don't read to the middle of the book. That wouldn't do any good. (laughs) That's goofy. Like if you want to understand the story, you read to the end. And if you want to understand today, then you got to live today in light of eternity. If you don't, the pain will be too much. If you do, the pain you will recognize is an anticipation of what's to come. And we are barely scratching the surface of these things, but they're so critically important. And when I read Philippians 3, I almost, it's almost like I hear in, in the background of my mind a Mark chapter 8 where Jesus engages his disciples in a conversation about who Jesus is and what it means to follow him. And he says, listen, if you're going to follow me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. The cost of discipleship. But then he turns around and talks about the cost of non-discipleship. I'm asking for everything, but I'm giving you everything. What good is it if you gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? What good is it if you live it up in this life, but then when I come back, you're not ready? And so Jesus, in that case, is telling them, you're going to lose everything, but it's going to be worth it. Now, I wonder, so, you know, why is it that Jesus talks about this to them in Mark chapter 8 instead of Mark chapter 15? Well, it's because if you don't wait till, if you wait till the end, if you wait till the moment of, of, of intensity, if you wait till the moment of, of, man, I'm about to lose everything if I stay close to Jesus, then you won't be ready for that particular moment. If you wait until the time when the cost is right in front of your face and you just 
can't imagine giving up anything that is held dear by you. If you wait until then to ask this question, then I don't think you'll be prepared for the question. But if you right now ask, do you believe that Jesus brings a life that is better than the life you had before him, than the life that you have without him, and why? Man, you'll be ready for whatever comes if you have an answer to that question. So put differently, I think you'll be ready for whatever's coming down the pike. And I don't know what's coming down the pike. I have no idea what this culture is going to look like in 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Maybe we'll be fine. Maybe we won't. But either way, we'll be okay. And we'll be ready to the extent that we've internalized what Paul says in the first wow. half of Philippians. It was long and it was very fast. But uh, he's touching on some extremely good points. And he started off with that question. I think we'll just discuss the question before I move into the verse by verse. Do you think that life with Jesus is better than without him? And then if you do, why do you believe that? Okay. We all need to ask ourselves that question because Paul is very clearly saying he considers all his past life, all his achievements, what, uh, as he explained, some of it was by birth, he got certain uh, benefits, others were by achievement. And he says all that is rubbish. In fact, it is like hindering his knowing Christ. Okay. So the question is, do you believe, do we believe, do each one of us, okay, I, we can't generalize it, it's personal, of course. Do I believe that a life knowing Jesus is better than a life not knowing him? And if so, why? Okay, so let's just go now into the verses. I need to start sharing again. Uh, <clears throat> go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Okay, that's finished. Okay, so the first section, uh, in fact, the only sections I'm going to look at. Uh, so I think today I'll read the verses so that we can go faster. Okay. Uh, finally, my brothers, already Michael has said it, but finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble for me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Jesus Christ and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is the section we're going to look at today. We won't consider 12 to 14, okay? All right, the first verse is, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Okay, there are a few things that uh, stand out here. A couple of things, actually. One is, he calls them to rejoice again. The recurrent theme throughout this letter is rejoice. Okay, and he's writing from a prison. Uh, okay, he's writing from house arrest, maybe. But still, he's under imprisonment. Okay, and it's not really a good place to be. Uh, and he has no idea about his future because, you know, when he writes, he says, I hope I come to you. Okay, he's not sure about that. Okay, so in the in and through those circumstances, he is asking them to rejoice in the Lord, not rejoice in anything else, but rejoice in the Lord, in their knowledge of God and in their in the salvation that God is offering them. Okay, secondly, he's, he's, he's saying, I'm going to write again repetition of previous instructions and without apology. Okay. It's, in fact, he's saying, it's no trouble. I need to say these things again and again. And in, you know what? It's safer for you that I repeat them. Okay. Now, there, there are quite a few teachers in this uh, group. So you will know what the power of repetition. Okay. But there's a verse 
uh, and by Peter that touches on the same point of repetition. Second Peter, first chapter, verses 13 to 15 says, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder. Since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, he's saying that he, he, he expects to die soon, okay? as our Lord Jesus has made clear to me. Okay? And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able to, at any time, to recall these things. So he's reminding them again, this is Peter, so that they can recall it. The same thing, uh, let me get my cursor on, I love it, okay, laser pointer, <laughs> okay. The same thing uh, Paul is saying, to write the same thing to you is no trouble to me and in fact is safe for you, okay. So this first verse, you can take away these two things. I mean, though they might not be connected, maybe it is because one of the instructions is saying is rejoice, no matter what the circumstances, rejoice because of the fact that you are in Christ, you need to rejoice. And I'm going to keep repeating this to you. Okay. I correct a lot of people for saying repeat again. So I, I almost said it now. So I won't say, okay. Uh, repeat again is wrong English, by the way. I think uh, Gita knows that. Anyway, right. So this is the first verse. Also in, in, in Joshua, it says, okay. The book, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Meditate on it day and night means, you know, you got to keep reading it again and again. You know, the book of the law was not the whole Bible in those days. It was just one or two books. And he was saying, Joshua is saying, or God is saying in Joshua, you need to keep reading it, keep reading it, keep reading it. Okay, repetition. Okay, then Psalms 1, chapter, verse 2 says, but the one, one who walks, you know, who doesn't stay by the uh, evildoers and all that, his delight, that person's delight, is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Again, it talks about a righteous man, that person meditates on the word of God day and night, repetitively, that's what it means, not 24-7, okay? We can't do that 24-7. All right, but it means repetitively uh, go and take go and take uh, nourishment from the word of God. Okay, so that's just for just the first verse. Okay, right. I'm learning some things in PowerPoint. I think I'm going to start teaching PowerPoint also now. Repetition is a key to understanding. That is why we use the expression to buy heart something. What does it mean by heart? You keep repeating it till you you memorize it, and, and from your head it goes into your heart actually. Okay, it, it stays there. That, so repetition or memorizing is a key to any understanding, but specifically so for the word of God, because the word of God is life unto us. Okay. All right. The next two verses, look out for the dogs, look out for the evildoers, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Uh, Roy, by the way, be ready to read the next verse when I ask you, okay? Yeah. Anyway, it's going to come on the screen. Okay, now these two verses I took together, look out for the dogs. Now, what is he talking about? It's pretty strong language. And uh, uh, some of you might know, we've seen it in Galatians also on this. And the subject that he's talking about is circumcision, okay? Physical circumcision. Uh, apparently, there were some people that every, every church that uh, Paul went and set up, uh, there was a group of people who would go in later, a little later or much later, and tell them, you know what, it's all fine, what Paul is teaching y'all, it's true, we need Jesus, but there are certain Hebrew customs you need to follow, and one of them is uh, circumcision, because that was a covenant establishing act given by God, you need to do that, okay? And Paul is so much against it, I mean, let's just look at Galatians, I'm not going into going into the details, uh, Galatians 5, 7 to 10 says, you were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven, leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who's troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. I put the next two verses and I took them out. In fact, the last verse, which is I think 11 or 12, he's saying, you know, these guys who insist that you need to do have circumcision, I hope they misfire and cut the whole thing off. He actually says that, Paul. Can you believe that? Okay, you can go and check it if you want. Okay, in, in ESV it says, I hope they emasculate themselves. Okay, that's pretty clear what it means. 
Uh, so he's that strong in saying, look, there is nothing you need to do to have salvation. The law is done. Okay. Again, in Romans 16 and so verse 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. Okay. Uh, we have to be careful if people come and give us a list of do's and don'ts, okay, for, for, for being a Christian life. That is not what it's about, being a Christian. Being a Christian is obeying those two, uh, uh, the greatest two commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. In these two, all the commandments are contained. That's what Jesus said. No? And that's what is needed for a Christian, not specific uh, lists of do's and don'ts. Okay, so what is Paul so furious about? Okay, he's really furious. I mean, he's written it somewhere else also. But Galatians is the whole, uh, the whole of Galatians is uh, uh, talking about some people who have come and tried to upset the Galatian people, saying you got to uh, circumcise yourself, you know. Uh, and and he actually says, you know, you were born by the Spirit. Now why are you trying to live in the flesh? In Galatians, he says that you know. Not only should we be rebirthed in the spirit, our new life has to be a spirit life, not a, a human life in that sense, okay? So let's just look at that. I'll quickly look at the uh, big one. Genesis 17, 9 to 14 says, and God said to Abraham, actually, Roy, go ahead, quickly, yeah. God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you through through." throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout the generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money, from any, any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and who and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay. You know, if, if you look at it, just just looking at these verses, you could probably understand why these Jews were so particular. They said, look, this is what uh, the, the Abrahamic covenant, sorry, uh, this is actually Moses' covenant, uh, laws say, okay, that the sign of our relationship with God is some flesh being removed from your body, okay? Now, what we need to understand here is uh, the Old Testament is always a shadow of the New Testament, okay? That is what uh, biblical teaching will teach you. The, the reality is in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is a shadow. And even this act of circumcision is a shadow because what Jesus is saying and what Paul says is die to your flesh daily. Okay. This is just a symbol or a shadow of that, that you need to, you know, your flesh is not the main part of you. Your spirit is the main part of you. Okay. And that is what is meant here. Just like when, when people said thou shall keep the Sabbath, it is a commandment. Okay, but nowadays, you know, in, 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 um, in the Middle East, it's on a Friday and uh, here it's on a Sunday and the original Sabbath is Saturday. Uh, I guess all of you all know that, right? So, you know, you can say you're not keeping the Sabbath, you know, you can, uh, and there are some Seventh-day Adventists, I think they keep Saturday as a, uh, the holy day. But, you know, the, that was in the Old Testament. The meaning of all that is contained in those two commandments and that is what we need to understand, okay? So this is the original commandment about circumcision. And Paul is furious at people who teach legal requirements and works in the plan of salvation, okay? At the same time, he does indicate in many places that there is a requ requirement of being separated unto God, okay? That is important, okay? And let's look at a few verses of that, okay? Romans 6.22. Mama, why down? Romans 6.22. But now that you have been set free from sin, and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Okay, it's interesting that he mentions eternal life here because that's exactly what he's saying 
in the last verse that we looked at, uh, uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 11, okay? Set free from sin, become slaves of God. Yeah, most of the, uh, most of the uh, versions have uh, holiness instead of sanctification. They both mean the same thing, by the way. Yeah? ESV is now that I've decided to use ESV, I have to stick with it, okay? Uh, some more verses, Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, flesh, okay? You need to separate your flesh and be holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship, okay? One more, at least. Okay, First, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of our body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. Again, you know, keeping the flesh uh, to the side. That is not the primary uh, uh, person that we are, okay? And finally, 2 Timothy verse 1, chapter 1, verse 9. He who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. Okay, so... Paul is not saying that uh, you don't need to do circumcision, you don't need to do everything as long as you believe uh, you're saved and you're uh, assured uh, salvation and resurrection, okay, eternal life. No, he's saying there are things you have to do. And that's what he, that's why he's writing these letters to these churches, because he had gone and set up these churches. And some places he finds that they are drifting away a little bit here and there. He writes letters concerning that. Some places he finds they're really getting uh, uh, compromised by for people who have come into the church and upset them. He writes letters concerning that. Uh, where even where there are good things, he reminds them. He's very happy with the Philippians generally, but he reminds them that they got to stay in that, okay? And keep the joy of the Lord. Okay. Now, in verse 3, he clarifies who the people of true circumcision under the new covenant are, okay? Let's look at that, verse 3. Those who worship in spirit and truth, y'all can look at verse 3 if you want. Uh, uh, then, those who glory in Christ Jesus and those who put no confidence in the flesh. These are the people of true circumcision. Not the shadow, but the real circumcision of being a spirit person as opposed to being a flesh person, fleshly person. Okay, That's why he says you need to die to your flesh daily and put on Christ, who is the new spirit in you. Okay, uh, So these are the three points that you can take away from verse 3. This does not mean that the law was wrong, okay? Matthew 5, 17, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The law was fulfilled. There is no requirement. I mean, the requirements of the law were met in Jesus Christ. We don't have an obligation to live under the law, okay? For the law of the spirit in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Somewhere in Romans, I don't know where exactly. I'm sure some of you will know. Am I? Let's not waste. You know, that Paul is again and again saying it is the law of the spirit that matters, not the law of the flesh, which was the Old Testament. Okay. Romans 12, 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. Did we finish that? Holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I think I did this already, right? Anyway. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit. Yeah, I did that. I think it's just a cut and paste that uh, <laughs> didn't work. All right, never mind. Now, in verses seven and eight, I've, I've left out uh, uh, the where, the part where he lists down all his uh, qualifications and all that. We all know that, no? He has learned to empty himself of everything that could bring him pride. Okay, we discussed that in uh, some earlier session. Jesus emptied himself of his God. Godhead, literally, okay? And that's how humble he became. And here, Paul is, of course, nobody can compare ourselves to Jesus in terms of emptying himself. Uh, but Paul is saying all these things that at one time I thought uh, were of value to me, my, uh, my background, my upbringing, my education, whatever gain I had, you know, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the work of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, okay? And I'm ready, I have suffered loss and I count them rubbish that I may gain Christ. I'm ready to suffer loss again in any way, okay? There was a time when Paul thought he was a religious person and 
following the law pretty well. But after his encounter with Christ, what happened? He realized that all his qualifications and achievements as a devout Jew were nothing. Okay, were nothing. Okay. He learned to himself, empty himself of all those achievements and qualifications. Why? Because he found that they were actually a hindrance to knowing Christ better. If you keep those things as some, of some value in your life, you will not get to know Christ as well as you should. Okay, that's what he's saying. And then getting to know Christ better and better was what he wanted above everything else in his life. This is what comes out of these verses, 7 and 8 and 9 to 11 actually. Okay, 9 to 11 says, to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, that comes from the law, okay, not from the flesh, not from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ Jesus, Christ Jesus, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, okay, that righteousness can be built up only through the Holy Spirit continuing to be uh, a strong element in your life. Bao Chen mentioned to me one day, the anointing of the Holy, anointing of the Holy Spirit has to be in our life. Now, that's a that's a difficult subject and that's a subject I'm not yet qualified to go into. But what it means at the very minimum is letting the spirit decide how you should live your life. Okay. Now, how does that work out in reality? We can look at it hopefully uh, further down in our Bible studies. Okay. How does, how, what is the reality of living by the spirit? We can look at that. Okay. So Paul wants to know him more and more. And, he, and as, as uh, Michael DeFazio said, it's not just knowledge. No, personal knowledge of Jesus Christ, personal relationship with Jesus Christ is what he's talking about. I want to know him, okay? And through that knowing that I, I you know, I, I share in his suffering, not just uh, not have empathy for what Jesus went through. No, actually in this life, I, I start going through sufferings because of my faith in Jesus Christ, because of my belief in who he is in my life and who he is really in this world. You may have to suffer as as uh, Michael said, you know, this world nowadays, we are the minority, okay? That wasn't the time some time ago when the church became the official religion of Rome and uh, it was advantageous to be a Christian. It's not so anymore. It's no longer advantageous to be a Christian. I don't know, maybe in Kerala it might be, but generally across the world, you are looked at as uh, what homophobic and all that stuff, okay? Uh, and then not only in his suffering, but somehow to share in his death, becoming, uh, you know, and he believes that only through that can he really attain the resurrection from the dead. Is it a process he's talking about? No, it's not a process he's talking about. He's talking about a faith and a life based on that faith, okay? And, and that is not the prosperity gospel. I can tell you all right here and now, okay? That is not the prosperity gospel. To share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and through that, to attain the resurrection, meaning eternal life, okay? That, uh, this is what Paul is teaching, and this is what the Bible is teaching. Let me tell you all that. Okay. What happened? I think my. All right. Now he goes into more detail in these remaining verses, and yeah, we are stopping at 11, as I said, okay, on what really matters to him now more than anything else in the world. Okay. He's in prison in Rome, and he's telling them, I'm so happy. Okay. Oh boy. He not only wants to know Christ, but he wants to be found in him. Okay. Now, what does that mean? 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Okay. It's not just believing in Christ, but you have to be in Christ. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That means your, your life is merged with Jesus Christ. Okay. That's why he says, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone, and he's talking to believers, you know, it's, it's addressed to our church uh, in the revelations that uh, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Most of our families had pictures of that representation in our dining rooms or wherever, you know, Jesus standing at the door and knocking. He is talking not to unbelievers, to believers, okay, that you guys are shutting me out. I am standing and knocking. Open it so that I can come and be with you, that I am in you and you are in me. That is what he's saying here, okay? Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Okay, he wants to be found in him, mind you. Christ who lives in me. And now I live life in the, the and, sorry, and the life I now in the flesh, live in the flesh, meaning my earthly life, which is now flesh bound. I don't live according to fleshly standards. I live by the faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Okay, that I'm trying to explain what it is to be found in Jesus. Okay, 
Ephesians 2.20 For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, created in Christ Jesus, okay, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So it's all talking about being in Christ, okay? Okay, it's in one more. If then, that's Colossians 3, 1 to 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Okay? To be found in him. Not just knowing him, not just having a personal relationship with him, uh, but actually becoming sort of merged with Christ so that he rules through the Holy Spirit. He rules your entire life. Now, as I said, the mechanics of the process of it, it, it on an earthly basis, uh, you know, as, as Joy might say, let's get practical more. And what do you mean by all these verses? It's not that easy, but we can look at it later, God willing, if God gives us all more revelation. Okay? He wants to share in his suffering also, by the way, and even follow him into death. Okay? And he believes that only with such an attitude and behavior, he will be able to attain the resurrection from the dead, meaning attaining eternal life. Okay, so we've come to the end of our uh, study for today. And I got this fancy thank you. <laughs> okay, but there's one song I want to, uh, it's only four minutes, you guys should listen to it. It's, it's based on this exact set of verses and it's by Graham Kendrick. The song is called The Way Me. How dear built my life upon all this world reveals and wars to own all I once thought gain I have counted lost spent and worthless now compared Join my
10 30 uh, so swam i suggest at least 15 minutes you'll stay because the wedding is only at 11 o'clock okay uh, if you need to repeat something learn the song really it is almost entirely verses 7 to 11 okay and uh, it's a good good verses to repeat to yourself it's a lovely song uh, i'm sure dilip knows it maybe ajit also but it's, it's a song from a long long time ago and it's directly lifted from philippians uh, Chapter 3, verses 7 to 11, I think. Okay, So uh, it's a wonderful song to learn. It's easy to sing. Uh, and it will reinforce, as we said, repetition. It will reinforce the kind of life that we are called to live in this world. Uh, and it will help us. Okay, So, okay. Uh, so, Swama, if you want to go first, then uh, go ahead. Unmute. Uh, you already unmuted. No, not unmuted. No, not unmuted. No, sorry. <laughs> She'll have to. She'll have to do it. So, what's the name of Ah, John iPad. Sorry. John I. Ah, so so unmute, unmute yourself and unmute any leg. Ah, okay. Pardon. Say it. Say it. And then Londa also saw Brian. Pinne Pinne man mute mute tail. Yeah, Pinne Okay. Okay, now it's fine. No. Ah. Nothing uh, special. Nibar. I have to now read through again and uh, grasp more. Uh, I've noted down all the references and all that, uh, okay. but this will be there. No, I am. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Like uh, the recording. Uh, yeah, recording. Okay. Okay. Gita, you still can't hear me? Gita says, uh, is anyone, not, anyone else not hearing me? Gita, you can talk. In between, here. there was some uh, break. Ah, no, yeah, my... yeah, a little cr cracking up like that. Ah, no. okay. But now it is uh, clear. All right. Gita, what's going on? Gita, what's yeah, go ahead. Now I can now I can see you. Okay. Anything to say, Gita? No, I, I no. This is a very difficult topic. I mean, <laughs> what I mean is that the concept of uh, you know uh, Paul's is very. I mean, it's uh, huge for us uh, mere earthly beings to. <laughs> You know, it comes back to the question that uh, Michael Defazio asked at the very beginning. You need to yeah. ask yourself, all of us need to ask ourselves that question. Do we really believe what we are <laughs> listening to in church? Do we really believe what we are preaching? <laughs> Some of us are preaching like me, okay? Do we really believe that? And if so, why? You know, Why, why should that be better than a reasonably good life in this earth? Uh, you know, I mean, he went through it. I don't need to repeat that, okay? <laughs> so it, it's not... It, yeah, what, let me, what, what, let me uh, say and then we'll go. Ah, okay, Mama Varana. No, no, the question he asked in the beginning, uh, it's definitely uh, life with Jesus uh, is uh, better and uh, uh, joyful than uh, if we live just a worldly life, enjoying all the pleasures of the world also. But uh, when forgetting all that or counting all that uh, garbage and then uh, looking to Jesus, but he never says not to enjoy life. Here also Paul says uh, rejoice in Jesus. There are so many things we can rejoice in him. Why don't we find out that? And uh, as earthly beings, one thing that Paul has done here may be difficult for us to all our achievements and all our family or whatever we are born to, uh, big great families or to great parents or believers, all that here 
uh, to just to leave everything and like Paul to count all that garbage, uh, we may find it a bit difficult. But that is because of our relationship. Or we are not fully in Christ. I think that maybe that is the reason why we can't uh, count all the other things uh, as uh, garbage or rubbish. And about circumcision also, uh, even um, our um, bodies are temples of God, the Holy Spirit. So we have to keep it uh, holy. That's what I believe. Uh, and uh, in the Old Testament, so many things were there. Uh, but as you said, it was a shadow of uh, what Christ was going to do in our lives. So when we look at Christ, I don't think all those things are important. But we uh, deny ourselves and follow him, whatever, wherever he has placed us, as it is, uh, take up his cross and follow, whatever. We may not even consider it as a cross, but uh, Christ has placed us wherever each one of us are with all our duties and responsibilities, however big or small or difficult or burdensome it is. Just follow him. When we follow him, he will give us uh, the moments uh, to rejoice in him. That's what it's as Gita said, it's a very huge, maybe later on we can discuss a, a very huge passage with a lot of uh, things that, um, as uh, that uh, he pointed out here is one, I think uh, the only one place or one of the places where he says, Jesus Christ, my Lord, mm. he is personalizing him like that. Uh, can we personalize him in all our life experiences that he is my Lord and because he is my Lord and he is in me and I am in him, how I have to live. I have to repeatedly meditate on the word of God. God is talking to us through the uh, word. He is talking to us through the Bible. And uh, we have to repeatedly, not read, but meditate on that. If we have to uh, live a life um, with Christ, and as he said, die with Christ and have the hope of resurrecting uh, one day when Christ gives us that uh, power or God gives us that power to uh, rise again, even if we are dead. That's what I believe. And it is a very huge subject. I listened to some of others also. I think we will go now. I will go now to look to that wedding reception. I, I will listen to the recording later. Okay. okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bao Chang? പേഴ്സണൽ എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് എത്ര മാത്രം വലുതാണോ അപ്രകാരമേ നമ്മളുടെ വിശ്വാസത്തിൽ ഉറച്ചു നിൽക്കാൻ പറ്റത്തുള്ളൂ കാരണം ഇപ്പൊ ഞാൻ അങ്ങോട്ട് സംസാരിക്കുക ദൈവത്തോട് പറയുക ദൈവം തിരിച്ച് സംസാരിക്കുന്നത് നമ്മൾ കേട്ടോ അതാണ് പ്രധാനം ആ കേൾക്കുന്നില്ലെങ്കിൽ നമ്മളെ പഠിത്തവും മറ്റ് കാര്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ വളരെ ബുദ്ധിമുട്ടായി പോകും നമ്മൾ പഠിത്തം പഠിത്തം കൊണ്ട് അവസാനിക്കും പക്ഷെ എക്സ്പീരിയൻസ് ചെയ്യണം അതായത് ഞാനിപ്പോ ഒരു കാര്യം പറഞ്ഞു അതിന്റെ മറുപടി കേട്ടു ഞാനൊരു സംഗതി ആ ഒരു ഒരു റിലേഷൻഷിപ്പ് കീപ്പ് ചെയ്യണം ഉണ്ടാവണം എന്നുള്ളതാണ് എന്റെ ഒരു ചിന്ത കാരണം സെന്റ് തോമസ് എങ്ങനെയാ പറഞ്ഞത് വെൻ ഹി സോ ജീസസ് ഈ ബിലീവ് മൈ ലോഡ് ആൻഡ് മൈ സേവിയർ സെന്റ് പോൾ സെയിം തിങ് ഹാപ്പൻ ഈ യേശു പ്രത്യക്ഷപ്പെട്ടപ്പോഴാണ് പോൾ യേശു വിശ്വസിക്കാൻ തുടങ്ങിയത് സോ എല്ലാ മനുഷ്യർക്കും ഒരു ഒരു പോയിന്റ് ഓഫ് എന്താ പറയുന്ന ആ കണക്ഷൻ അങ്ങനെ അങ്ങനെ ഫേമാകത്തു എന്നാ എന്റെ ഒരു ചിന്ത അല്ലാത്തവർ കാണും when two friends get together it's not only one person who talks both talk to each other so as you yeah. said if we consider G- and jesus calls us friends okay so in i mean in a limited way we are friends of jesus but we have to let him talk also into our lives not just we can, we give our list of petitions and supplications and or even thanksgiving you know we have to listen also you know not just us our prayers should not be just non non stop uh, uh, petition uh, supplication and thanksgiving and praise you know once in a while you stop and listen be still and know that i am lord god says right yeah god wants in a while every time every time yeah once in a while like please once in a while of course every time is better <laughs> okay uh dilip go ahead yeah thank you 
Where are you? Oh, hang on. Let me just get the door. Just pull Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, Dilip. Where are you? Why are you getting muted again? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Tell me. No, uh, you know, I think I, I don't have much to say except that, you know, uh, just to answer what uh, oh, Gita's got probably. You know, Gita's there. No, it's just uh, something that we have to, you know, it's God that looks at the uh, at our heart and our attitudes. You know, we can we can be ticking all the right boxes. You know, attending church, attending Bible studies, preaching, whatever we want to do. But he we he always looks at why we do it. You know, is it because we love him, or is it just because we you know we think it's a good thing to do, or we have other motives? Like you know, you go to church because it's a social activity, you like to meet everybody. You know, is that the reason why you go to church or is it because you, uh, you know, you really want to worship, you want to listen to him, you want to listen to what the preacher is saying, whatever, worship him. So I think he looks at our attitudes and our motives for everything more than anything else. And I think that's what we need to always look at in, in that sense. And of course, it's in our human, in our human uh, effort, we love be able to do it. So we always need the Holy Spirit to help us do it. And that's the only thing I, I have to say. Uh, you know, the joy of knowing Jesus is something we all have to experience and and ask the Holy Spirit to help us do that. So the motives that we do for everything, whatever it is, uh, is because we love Him and we want to please Him. And that's the important thing. And that's all I have to say. All right. Thanks. Yeah. That's uh, very sad. Um, Suja, you want to say anything? For me, uh, hi, everybody. Hi, I think it's, uh, it's, come, it's come to a very deep realization that it's more of Jesus and less of me. How much of humility we need, and that is when Jesus comes to us. It's all our self-righteousness need to be put away. And when his righteousness comes up, his glory is revealed with his anointing. I think, I think that that relationship is very, very different. And that's where worldly things take a step behind. Uh -huh. It doesn't matter to us anymore. Because every day is a step forward with God to be able to walk in his ways. And uh, these passages clearly reveals that. It's not about circumcision. It's not about baptism. It's not about our rituals. It's not. These are all man-made. I mean, true, circumcision came from the Abrahamic covenant. But uh, Jesus came and defeated all that at the cross. And he removed every obstacle. And he definitely wants a relationship with us, very close relationship. So that's what we need to focus on. Thank you. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, perhaps the word defeated is uh, less appropriate than fulfill what was required. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Good. Uh, Ajoy, you must have learned how to unmute yourself now. Come on. Ajoy, yeah. Not yet, not yet. Oh, okay, go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Well, <clears throat> to be with Christ would also mean having many of his qualities be putting in, or what, many things that he expects of us, we put into Hello, practice. Okay. Forgiveness, <laughs> gentleness, kindness, generosity, and you know what, I think eight or nine things like that. While it is easy to say it's great to live with Christ, many advantages, yes, his guidance, his protection, all that will be with us. But Practicing it in exactly the way he 
would like us to do may be difficult. That's all I can say. Uh -huh. Yeah, practice is always difficult. And in fact, the word of God, the New Testament says, it is impossible for us to do it on our own strength or ability. We have to depend on the Holy Spirit. And as I said that, for us, it could be a vague concept as of now. What does it mean, depend on the Holy Spirit uh, to lead our lives? But uh, I have found, okay, now I've, I've, I became a believer in 1995, okay? And uh, it's, it's, got, it's, it's quite a long time now. But small changes have come, okay? Small changes, not much, but small changes have come. As you, you just spend time in devotion, spend time in reading the word of God, uh, and, and those changes will come through the Holy Spirit. I, I can guarantee it, okay? Uh, in fact, big changes will come as you spend more time in the Word of God and more time in communicating with God. As Bhavachan said, not just giving a list of our requirements, but also listening to what God wants in and through us. Because at the end of the day, God wants big things through us, each one of us, okay? Which is to save souls. There's no bigger thing. All of heaven rejoices when one soul is saved. That's what it says, okay? All of heaven rejoices, <laughs> So uh, anyway, so uh, that's it's not easy, but it's that's the calling that each Christian has in his or her life. Yeah. All right, uh, Jesse, go ahead. Can I say something? Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you, Jeff, for Jesse. Yeah. Praise God for this topic. Uh, like uh, Bao Chan said, like you said, uh, yeah. the change of the uh, knowing Jesus. Yeah. Uh, I think so. There's a verse in uh, Matthew, I think so, which says eternal life is knowing uh, Jesus, knowing God. Knowing God, yeah. So once we have experienced, you know, the the uh, Holy Spirit work in our life, and we have uh -huh. committed our life to Jesus, that, like the verse says, we become a new creation. The head knowledge transforms you. You become a new creation. That is something to experience. Sure. And with that uh, conversion, I think so, the fruit of the Spirit is also very evident in a Christian's life. So, and everything that we do, you know, it stems out of the love for our Christ, for, for the Lord, the devotion for the Lord. You know, the uh, when you know, uh, you know, whenever I uh, read that verse where Jesus is... Um, uh, asking a lady that why are you giving the bread to the dogs? And uh, the lady says that uh, even the uh, dogs eat from the master's table. And God says, uh, your faith has saved you. At that time, I always, I always consider myself in that lady's position that I was so unworthy of the salvation, you know. And Christ made it so easy for us to just believe in his work and be saved. That is something a huge, you know, surpassing uh, gift that I cannot consider because I feel I, on my own, I would have definitely not made it. And it is all God's mercy and grace that he knew our limitation and he gave Christ to us so that we can be saved. So I really praise God for that. And that is something very precious. Definitely any amount of uh, intelligence or any amount of ability I had, I wouldn't be able to. Uh, you know, earn a salvation for myself. It is only by his mercy and grace that I'm able to, you know, come to the knowledge that uh, the work of Christ has saved me. So I really praise God and thank God for that. And that realization and, uh, you know, that experience with the um, Holy Spirit has really changed me, transformed me into a new person. So I really praise God and thank God for that. Praise God. Yeah. Stop. Jesse, okay. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, actually, regarding this, I I feel I am the least uh, you know knowledgeable in these things to talk in anything. But I really would like to recollect something and share um, because there was a situation when here somebody uh, he was working in the sales for a long time in a company, and uh, what happened is. Um, Somehow the management accessed all his, uh, pro, you know, all his things from his computer and uh, made everything his own. Means whatever deals he had done and everything and never the contracts. And uh, eventually they put a 
case on him so that they didn't have to pay him commission or anything. It was big amounts. And um, so he was like so vulnerable and he was thrown out of the company. And now it is the second year running. And uh, it's the COVID time. And, you know, uh, so once his wife shared with me that, you know, he even feels he may be going to depression or like that, even because lawyer fees and all are so huge and uh, they are taking the best of the situation. So then I had a talk with him. It was uh, more than one hour it went. And um, he said, you know, I thought, you know, I was very prayerful about all these God things. You know, all, I used to pray on my knees, um, you know, at least three times in a day. I used to be with God. I used to really share with him. And uh, despite all these things, I am standing very much at the place where I started. So whatever it is, uh, if he has to be with me, something has to happen sometime. But I feel it is like uh, infinity. Nothing is happening. And actually, I, I talked to him all the time knew. And uh, again, I think we came back to square one. I felt very puzzled because, you know, I couldn't tell about him to anybody. And uh, so I thought, no, I will just mention it here because, you know, about again talking to him, I, uh, I dare not because I don't know really how to really tell, you know, see, this is it. Because I told him, a bro is read, he will not break and uh, he is very faithful. So his time is not, you know, what we think is the time, you know. He has his own time and eventually you will prevail. Mm. But uh, nothing seemed to make him convinced. And then he said, finally, don't, uh, don't feel bad and all, you know, I am not depressed. I will not do anything to myself. Um, but I am still praying, but not the way I used to pray before. Not with that conviction. So I really thought when you come across such a person, how you will, um, you know, really, you know, support that person about walking with the Lord and being with him, you know, people just lose that faith, you know. So when you come across such a person, what you will do? Because that's a big job, I thought, a big responsibility. Okay, for me, so, it's very clear, Jesse, okay. And uh, yeah, if we allow people to build their foundations of faith on the wrong foundations, these things happen. That person was equating his relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ. Because of some physical, material situations that happened to him, he's not able to, uh, you know, you're having a break in your prayer life because you're going through a difficult time. But to actually to break away from God because, you know, I expected more from God. Okay? From what you were saying, that's what uh, his logic was. You, you, we need to understand, as, you know, the last verse that we looked at, he said, somehow to share in the su kind of suffering that Jesus suffered, even to the point of death, so that I may attain to salvation. That is, I mean, maybe the guy is not ready for that kind of message, but that is the true message, okay? Uh, so we should not pamper people with God. It's not God's time. One day it's going to happen. Don't worry, you'll come out of jail or whatever. It may not happen, okay? Paul didn't come out of jail. He died in jail, okay? I mean, let, I, if at all, as I said, if, if there's one thing that I want all of us to take away from these Bible studies, don't measure your relationship with God with what happens to you in this life. That, that's a false standard, okay? That's absolutely a false standard. You can have an extremely poor person. I mean, I take the case of Nick Yuji. He doesn't have hands and legs, okay? And he's living a life glorifying God. And, and I think, oh my God, what is... What is he and what is I? What am I? Okay. How is a person who was born without two hands, without two feet, able to live a life for Christ? Okay. That's that's what we have to show people. But yeah, there are we have to be sensitive to them. In the, they're going through a difficulty, and they are, you know, actually he's saying, okay, I'm not depressed. Don't worry, I'm not going to do anything. Uh, we, we need to be careful that you don't give them the wrong words. Uh, as I said earlier in James, you need to give them physical and material support also, not just say, I'll pray for you and then go away. No, you can't do that because that, that may hurt them more than just, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, not going and visiting them at all. You just go and say, hey, brother, uh, everything be well with you. God's timing is not today, maybe tomorrow. And then you go away. No, that may not help. You may have to give physical help also. But at the same time, let's not Let's not shy away from what is what the gospel is. The gospel is not about this life, okay? Uh, Michael DeFazio said uh, in Mark chapter 8, uh, Jesus says, 
if you really need you know, I want to follow me you will have to take up your cross and follow me that's what jesus told them not at the end before they started having their uh, sufferings and before they started having all the problems of believing in him okay now it does not mean that your life will be fine. if your life is good materially praise god for that and be happy and know that it is it can it can be very temporary it can go i mean uh, we, we need to be wise about whatever uh, God has given us in terms of assets, whether material or uh, time or uh, you know, uh, anything and everything. So don't, I, I request all of you, don't misunderstand the gospel. Is that too strong? I don't know. Maybe, maybe it is, but that's all I can say. Uh, Jesse, you want to uh, say something else? No, no, no. Yeah? But did you understand what I was trying to say? That, uh, I understand. This life does not determine whether you are a follower of Christ or not. I mean, uh, your circumstances in this life, which may change overnight. I mean, you take the case of Paul. Let me just read the Acts of the Apostle and see what all happens to him in those three or four years. I don't know how many years he went through those journeys. Okay, it's not a life of pleasure. He was leading a life of uh, reasonably good comfort. Okay, uh, in fact, it, it says he was on a horse when he was encountered by. Uh, Jesus, right? I mean, uh, we never hear of Jesus going on a horse anywhere, but Paul was going on a horse on the road to Damascus, okay, when he was met by uh, Jesus, okay, and he fell off the horse, it says, right? Uh, so, you know, he was a man who had reasonably good comfort in this life. He he, he, he was educated under a scholar of that time, so he, his family had money, presumably. So, and yet he says, all this is rubbish, and Michael DeFazio goes into more detail about what that rubbish is, okay? It's like a, a pamper that's been in the... <laughs> okay. So, you know, let's not, let's not, uh, let's not confuse uh, success in this world or sudden change of uh, reversal of fortunes in this world as somehow God is unhappy with us or there is no God at all or whatever. That will be a terrible, terrible yeah. thing to build your foundation on, okay? That's all I can say. Yeah. Roy, anything yet or still uh, quiet and listening? I'm doing Just listening. Just huh? listening. Okay. Shiva, I can tell you. Ajita. Ajita, thank you. I'm going to say it. Ajita, anything to say? No, Ajita, I'm going to say it. Roy. Roy. Roy, Roy. I don't know. Okay. Ellen. Yeah, Ellen, uh, she's already said that when she's ready, she will speak. <laughs> uh, okay, I think most of us spoke today and uh, reasonably okay. Yeah. 11 o'clock, the wedding will start. So, yeah. go and listen to it. thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I, nothing you, is me, coming. We are all. <laughs> eh? oh, yeah. Kitten okay. Yeah, kitten nila. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the, these are difficult topics and uh, I'm having a tough time. But believe me, that morning, when this morning when I got that song and I started listening, I started crying. Okay, really, it's a song I know from a long time ago, uh, and it's almost verse for verse from uh, word for word from these verses. Okay, uh, and and uh, I don't know. Uh, Graham Kendrick has got it, uh, got a good tune also to it. I again suggest that we can just sing it to ourselves, sing it, uh, and it, it's like like some of the praise and worship songs are actually uh, taken word for word from the Psalms. Okay. Those kind of scriptural songs, it's good to sing because effectively we are taking scripture into our uh, uh, to our uh, mind and to that into our hearts. Okay, all right. Thank you all so much. God bless you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. See you. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. Enjoy the wedding. Yeah. Bye. We're not getting the feed yet, but let's see. Okay. <laughs>